so here we are, and in two weeks there's the second and last presentation starting. And a week after that is the normal time, but you can do the early ones in two weeks. So we'll put some thought into your next presentation. The last ones were very good, so we'll do it again in the same way, five minutes each, and I think no more than eight in a night, so people don't fall asleep too much. But they were pretty good, and I was very impressed by you folks. So we're up to chapter six, um, authentication methods. Um, you have to somehow prove that you are who you claim to be. The most common, because it's the cheapest, is a password. Uh, something you know, this is the weakest form of proof, but it is the easiest to implement, cheapest, and therefore the most common. It is the lowest level security that's everywhere. Um, what's better is to have two of these methods combined. There's something you know, something you have, and something you are are the basic types. Um, there are a couple variants that come up these days, like where you are. So static passwords are the most common type. Uh, passphrases are better, where you have a whole sentence with punctuation. There are one-time passwords you use just once, and you get another one next time from something like an app or a token. And there's dynamic passwords that measure something, so we'll get there. These are reusable passwords, typically user-generated. Uh, this is the weakest and most common method, and pieces get hacked all the time. It's pretty easy to guess somebody's password. If they get to choose it, it's usually the name of their dog or something. And um, it's pretty easy to trick people into putting their password somewhere foolish, like sending it through plain text or answering a phishing message or, you know, these things get hacked all the time. Um, past phrases are supposed to be better, whole sentences. Um, of course, much stronger if you use nonsense words instead of uh, known phrases. One-time passwords are used only one time. These are typically used for things like password reset emails. You log in and change your password. If you want to use these all the time, then you have a problem of distribution, just like a one-time pad cryptography. And there's dynamic passwords. You buy these tokens, and it changes to something else every 30 seconds, and that's your password. You just have to have this object to provide it. Or you could put an app on your phone that does it. And this could be your only authentication method, if you want but it's not terribly secure. So strong authentication is when you combine two of those methods. And two of the same method doesn't count, like two things you know, a password and a PIN. That doesn't solve the problem. The reason why you need two different things is so they won't be correlated. Because what you're worried about here is a mass attack. If someone hacks the database with like SQL injection and they steal all the passwords, now they can get in all the accounts. And if they had pins required, the database would just have all the pins too, so they'd have those as well, and that wouldn't do any good. But if they had to have like a token in addition to the password, you wouldn't have any of the tokens, so you couldn't get into any of the accounts. And if you managed to steal some tokens, you'd have to match the token with the account, and that would be hard. That's why it makes you much more secure to have two-factor, where you have two different factors that are not correlated, so they will not both be stolen at the same time. In yeah. the post office, they use the, uh, for the laptops for external? They use the, the token and they use their last four digits, last or first four digits of their secret, their, their ID number, employee ID number. And how secret is that? Uh, well, is it, it was like, in that in the database hack that happened in the post office. They have that. And they and the if they got a hold of the token and knew who it came from, then they would. But the add, token does it change all the time? Yeah, it's it's like a regular token. It always like they always had to add their uh, right, okay. four digits of their. So that's good. Yeah. So then, if they stole the database, the token would save you. But they, if they, what, they stole this guy's token, they knew whose it was. Well, sure. Get in, yeah. Well, that's the one. A targeted attack, this doesn't help. Because yeah. they can just steal both things from you. The only thing it does is it lowers the damage of mass attacks. Yeah, but the, uh, the employee database is online somewhere already. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But hopefully it doesn't have the employee IDs in it. If so, that's pretty Well, I'm pretty sure they got everything. You know, I think they used the, uh, uh, what was that one SQL attack? The uh, Heartbleed. Heartbleed. I think that's what they used. I think that's what they used. Yeah. Well, yeah, Heartbleed was pretty gruesome. Yeah. Got everybody. Yeah. Anyway, um, all right, so like I say, you can often uh, password guess. If someone starts guessing in the live with something like Hydra, then you should be able to detect that with your logs. You'll have many, many attempts to log into the same account from the same IP address, and you ought to just have a clipping level. No more than five failed logins per hour or something, and then an account lockout, either until they go to the help desk or for a half hour or something after a certain number of guesses, and that will stop people from trying too many online. So um, you don't usually store plain text passwords on the server since the 70s because it's too dangerous. People can get a shell on the server and steal the file, so you put a password hash on the server. Now this is a not as secure as you might think it is. It turns out that cracking hashes is a whole lot more practical than it should be. 
the original thought of hashing is it's a one-way function. You can hash things, but you can't reverse it. But what you can do is make a huge dictionary of guesses and hash them all and find the one that matches. And that turns out to be far more effective than people thought it would be at first. So you store a password hash, and that process is called password cracking. And if you use a foolish kind of hashing like an MD5 or a SHA-1, you can try hundreds, millions, billions of guesses. Um, so the password hashes are in etched shadow on Unix. In Windows, they're in the security accounts manager file. They're also encrypted with a second um, layer of encryption called syskey encryption, but the syskey key is available, and it's been decades. Everyone's had tools that can decrypt it. So anyway, your local accounts are stored locally, your domain accounts are stored in the domain controller, but unfortunately, every account you've logged into on a Windows machine is stored on that machine and can be stolen from that machine later. So if the domain administrator goes to your machine and logs in, and then you go surf the web, click on a link, and get infected, they can steal the domain administrator's password hash, and in Windows systems, you can use it without even cracking it. You can just pass the hash. The hash is yeah. what's used to authenticate you over the network, so it's this is what's typically used to take over Windows systems. It's been known for 15 years, and Microsoft has done very little to fix it. In Windows 8 and Server 2012 R2, they made it possible to make a special account that can only be used on the domain controller and nowhere else. And if you actually do that in your company, then the domain controller can't, domain administrator can't make this mistake of logging in on a workstation. Mm -hmm. So Microsoft's attitude is it's your domain administrator being sloppy, which is possible. But until now, it's been a common practice of pen testers to use this because most companies do make that mistake of high privilege counts on low value machines. Anyway, um, so you can, you can steal password hashes from the network traffic. So Microsoft has made a few upgrades in the hashing system used for the network, which is stronger than what's stored on the disk, although still millions of times weaker than Unix hashes. And um, you can read it from RAM. So the Landman hash is this thing, LM. It's really looking pretty short. And so if I feed in the word password, the LM hash is E52. And if I feed in password with a capital P, the LM hash is E52. Because this thing is appalling. This thing dates from the 70s, back when computers were much, much slower. It breaks your password into two seven-digit chunks, changes all to lowercase to uppercase, hashes them separately, and is just fantastically weak by modern standards. So even Microsoft couldn't stand it, and they moved up to the NT hashes, which is what we're using now, which is one round of MD4, because it's so old, it predates the existence of MD5. So it is pathetic, but it's better than the LM hash. So a dictionary attack tries all the possible passwords, and a countermeasure is to have a password complexity and length rule. This is commonly used. Uh, that turns out to be extremely ineffective because you just download a dictionary of passwords that obey the complexity rule, and that's easy to get. So the only thing that really works is to try to crack the passwords on your own network with a known list of bad passwords. That's what you should do. And this is something that became much more practical earlier this year when Troy Hunt put an online API to his database. He has a database of all the stolen passwords, billions of them. And he made it so you could tie it to your domain controller. It'll automatically check every password against that list and not let you use a known compromised password. Almost nobody's doing that yet because that's new. But that would be much, much better than some kind of rule like it must be eight letters long and have an uppercase and a lowercase and a number. Because that does almost nothing. Because it turns out people just choose pretty much the same things within those rules. And you can just get a list of all those. Yeah. Locking it out after three times. Uh... That'll help. Yeah. Uh, but it won't do anything about password crack, hash cracking. Hash cracking means they somehow steal a file and then they crash it off. Okay. That does stop online attacks like Hydra, though. So brute force attack, you try all possible combinations of characters. Um, this is always going to work, of course. You'll sooner or later get the right character. But if your password gets longer than maybe eight or perhaps ten characters, it becomes impossible even with GPUs because every character makes it something like 80 times more, com more possibilities. Um, rainbow tables are an older technique. Uh, there was a time period when the price of RAM and the price of CPUs was such mm. that it was economical to store a huge lookup table in RAM and use it to make the calculation faster to do the hashing. That was particularly good back in the days of LM hashes. For modern hashes, the economics aren't, don't favor rainbow tables anymore. The tables would have to be so big that they don't do you a lot of good. Um, anyway, most people use a hybrid attack. This is what um, Hashcat does. And Hashcat OCL lets you use the GPU. It lets you start with a uh, brute force attack 
and then try, once you find some words, try modifying those words, like adding numbers to the end and changing upper to lowercase and changing letters to numbers that look kind of like the letters and so on. Yeah. The rainbow, rainbow table is the, um, the easy, easy um, recognized password. Is what? Easy recognized password. No, it's not. Rainbow table is not easily recognized passwords. What the rainbow table is, is like a table of multiplication. It just does some of the calculation involved in the hashing process so you can hash faster. So all the rainbow table does is by using a lot of RAM, you can do more guesses per second. So it's just, it's just a trick. It's called, you call it a time memory trade-off. Hmm. And um, it, it mainly was in the days of LM hashes. You can get rainbow tables for NT hashes, but they're very big and they don't speed it up as much as you'd like them to. Um, so what you should do is salt the password. You add a random character, some random characters to the password before you hash it, typically like eight characters. They call out assault, and therefore if two users choose the same password, they don't have the same password hash because you add different salt to each one. The salt is not a secret, and it's stored with the password. So, um, stored with the password hash. And so Microsoft gives you these password policies. They've been around since, I think, the days of Windows NT. Password history is how many passwords it remembers, so it won't let you change your password to a known old password. Yeah, your maximum minimum password age means you have to you have to change your password by this date, and you can't change it more often than this time, so you can't just change it through a cycle of 10 values and back to the first one, which is what people would like to do. That works at the college, by the way. <laughs> um, so that's, then there's, there's this stuff I talk about. I mean, length, complexity requirements. is some attempt to prevent you from choosing easily guessed words that turn out not to be very effective. And this reversible encryption is essentially the same thing as storing it in plain text, and that's disabled on all modern versions of Windows. The only reason you would enable that is because you want to be interoperating with something like Windows XP. It's terribly unsafe to turn that on, and I don't know anybody who turns it on willingly these days. Is that the same as uh, symmetric encryption? What's that? Is that the same as asymmetric encryption? Uh, no, there is no option for asymmetric encryption. Um, the only encryption the method reversible. reversible is symmetric. So it just does it scrambles it with a key, and there's a key somewhere. So all you have to do is find the key and reverse it. That's why it's essentially the same as plain text. And this is why I got so upset when I found out that like 50% um, or more of all Android apps do this. They store your password with reversible encryption, yeah. which all of us have known is a terrible thing to do for at least 25 years, except the Android app developers that did not yet get the memo. Did they, did they uh, publish where, where is the pudding? No, uh, not deliberately, but... No, they didn't publish it. Anybody but it's in the source it? code. Yeah, no, the Android app developers do not publish that they're doing this at all, but you get the source code with every Android app, so you can just look at it and see it. Is that a source code? Yeah. That's what I did. I looked in the source code. Well, first I just looked at the storage. If you just look at the storage, it's usually just right there in plain text. Mm -hmm. and if it's not, it's, it's pretty obvious what it is. And then I looked at the code. We did it in a mobile device hacking class. You guys will be doing it for homework if you take that class coming next semester and semester afterwards. Um, Android apps are very, very easy to reverse engineer. Very good way to get started. Not complicated at all. Much easier than x86 apps. Anyway, so, um, so you got password control. You got to write down your passwords and put them someplace, um, like sticky notes on the monitor. This is the thing people typically do that they shouldn't do. One thing I often tell non-technical people is just write it down on paper and put that wherever you put your $100 bills. You already know a safe place to put paper. <laughs> but you don't put it in a sticky note, put it in your wallet or something, and that's actually not so bad. Anyway, um, so you can have these tokens synchronized to the central server, like RSA Secure ID or Google Authenticator, where it's running some kind of mathematical process to create those apparently random numbers, and the server's doing the same thing, so the server knows what the number should be. Another one is an asynchronous dynamic token where you have to uh, enter a challenge that comes from them and it does some kind of math and you have a response. That's another way to do it. I don't see that hardly ever. The first kind is the most common. So you put in your username, the system sends you a challenge, you type the challenge into something, then your device tells you an answer and you send the answer up. You know, a lot of hassle. Most people would rather just have Google Authenticator spit out a number and you just type in the number. Anyway, then something you are. So third kind of authentication, so you could use your fingerprint. Um, if you're going to use a biometric system, and fingerprints are by far the most common because they're cheapest, um, then the way you rate these typically is by how long it takes to learn your fingerprint. That's called the throughput. And then how long it takes to recognize your fingerprint. And typically you want it to learn in two minutes or less and let you in in six to ten seconds. 
Other than that, it's too annoying and people don't like using it. And here's how you rate these things. There are two measures, uh, false reject rate and false accept. So you can adjust the sensitivity. If you turn the sensitivity way up, then it has a very small false accept rate, which means the wrong person very rarely gets in. But it also has a high false reject rate, which means even the right person is often rejected because it's so picky. If you turn it way down, then that almost never happens. The right person always gets in, but now some wrong people start getting in. So this crossover error rate, where the two numbers are the same, is just a way to rate the quality of your fingerprint device. So a high quality device has a low crossover error rate. A sloppy device has a high crossover error rate. You may not want to run your device at this point. The question is, in your business model, how much harm is done by blocking an authenticated user and how much harm is done by letting an unauthenticated user in. And I would think most people would probably rather be over here, where I would think I would probably like to say I have 10 times, um, I'm willing to kick out some real users to have a less chance of letting in the bad guys, but it's an issue. You can adjust it, but that's how you rate your thing. So fingerprints are the most common. It does not actually store a photograph of your fingerprint. It takes some kind of mathematical measurement of the distance between things, and they call that minutiae, and turns it into it. This is also how the police recognize fingerprints in forensics. They don't really take a photograph of it. They look for certain measurable properties, and they get a certain number of them that match, and then they call it a good match. What's bifurcation? A bifurcation is here. Bifurcation is where it splits into two. That's on mark. So if you, uh, you look for these things. Here's where two lines merge into one. So that's a point. Here's where one line starts. So that's a point. Here's where one ends. Here's where it splits into two. So those are the like topographical features, like the mountains and valleys. And you measure those in a distance between them. And that's how you create a measurement of a fingerprint. But, but when you cut your finger, the, the line mess up, right? Yes. And there are real cases of people that try to like burn their fingers off with acid and stuff and get them hurt in fires. And then their fingerprint is changed and you can't do this anymore. And that is an issue. Just like if you use voice recognition, people get a cold or something, and then or they get drunk and their voice is slurred, and now it doesn't work. You know, there's all the, that's the problem with biometrics. Of course, if you have passwords, people keep forgetting their password. So they all have this problem. A retina scan is another way. You shine light and look at the pattern of blood vessels on the back of your eye. This is considered very good, um, very accurate, but people do not like it. People feel bad about having to put their chin in a thing and stare in a hole, and, and they're worried that they're going to get a cold from the last guy sticking his chin in that thing. So they're not very popular. Making people use these is considered invasive and irritating. An iris scan is coming quickly. An iris scan just requires a high-resolution photograph, and what the Department of Homeland Security has very much wanted to have for a while is something they can put in an airport that will take a picture of everybody going by and do a biometric identification. They've been trying to do this for a while. They're trying to get face recognition good enough. Uh, supposedly, this is coming very soon, that this will be good enough, because uh, you've seen these billboards 20 feet across to say, I took this picture with an iPhone. Yeah. You know, the cameras are getting really good. So if your camera was good enough, they could just put a camera up there and photograph everybody going by and blow up the iris and get enough data to be sure who you are. And then they could compare that with the do not fly list or something, and it would be awesome. So we're headed there, but it's not quite there yet. Yeah, the minority report. Yeah. 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 yeah, I think they had it. Yeah, good. You put on sunglasses, you can rock it, right? Uh, apparently not. Apparently it goes through contact lenses and oh, sunglasses. Because you have to see. Yeah, it works through contact lenses and glasses. I'm not sure. I, I, but I, I, just a question of improving it. Some light it goes through the sunglasses. So you see, if you can see, some light is getting through. So it would just be a question of shining a wavelength or something. Yeah. So I was in Darian's class last semester, and we had a National Guard person that had been in Iraq. And he yeah. said that they used a portable iris scanner to identify people in Iraq so they'd know who was a real terrorist and who wasn't. So it was obviously a yeah. piece of military equipment that they oh, yeah. carried. Well, I think they've had it all along. If you can just stick something up to your face, they can totally do it. The question is, can they do it casually without you even noticing? Yeah, from like actually brought it in. It's, it's about the size of a large hair dryer. All right, and you had to stick your head in a little thing, yeah. right? Yeah. 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 That they've had forever. Yeah. Yeah. But the question is to improve it so it can happen just constantly to everybody. Like the license plate scanners they've got that just record every car that goes by. Yeah. They would like to just do that for your eyes. And we're very close to being able to do that. <laughs> yeah. And then there's hand geometry. Um, I've seen these things years ago at RSA. You just put your hand in a little cup about six inches above, and it measures the veins in your hand mm -hmm. by shining a red light through them. Um, Considered quite good, but the thing at that time it cost like $300 for the reader. Um, 
Keyboard dynamics is another one to see how you type, how long do you hold the keys down, what's the gap between the keys. The idea is just a computer measurement of the pattern of your typing will identify you. The good thing about this is you don't have to pay for a reader, a fingerprint reader or an eye scanner or something. Um, and they say it's pretty effective. Uh, I think Google um, CAPTCHA is using this now. You may have noticed Google CAPTCHA changed about nine months ago so that when it shows you a CAPTCHA, you often just have to click a box saying I'm a human and that's all it does because I think it's watching the way you use the mouse and the keyboard and it can tell if you appear to be a human or a bot. Hmm. That's why it frequently does not bother to show you some pictures and say pick out the ones that have street signs or something hmm. because it can already figure out that you seem to be human. Hmm. But anyway, um, then there's signature dynamics. You sign something with a pen and it measures the motion of your hand and that's probably characteristic too. And then of course voice print. This has been around for decades in science fiction. In practice it never worked so well because human voices are just very, very irritating. They're not always the same. It's very hard to recognize things. People slur their words. Boy, wait until you start suffering hearing loss and you'll notice how much people really slur their words. And people who are not native speakers in whatever language you're in are always very frustrated because people just rush over the words and slur things and you know it's very hard to understand something the way people really talk is very far from what you think they would say. And uh, so this turns out to be very unreliable in practice. But now I think we're getting there. Now we have these phone apps that can say, say yes or no and they can understand a little bit of simple things. But it turned out that um, taking vision and figuring out what's out there was much, much harder than people thought it would be in the 60s. And listening to a recording and finding out what people are saying is much, much harder than people thought it would be. In the 60s, they thought they'd have both those things working any day now. And then facial scan, right? This is awesome. Just take a picture of your face and then do whatever humans do. Humans have special brain structures just to identify faces, and so do monkeys. And they found there's a special cell to light up when you see a celebrity, you recognize that person and stuff like that. We've evolved through this. This is a super important thing to recognize your family and your friends and your enemies. And it turns out, again, very complicated, but they're trying to get it working. So a lot of this is uh, Super Bowl 35 had this. They're, they're trying to have something looking at everybody's face and spotting the terrorists. Is that what's in the X, the iPhone X? But, oh. Yeah, iPhone, now that you got the iPhone, yeah. yeah. There have been several generations. There was a scandal about four years ago because Lenovo bought a face, put up a computer that you could unlock with your face, yeah. but if you were black it didn't see you at all, didn't recognize you as a face. They didn't think of that, so they programmed it to look for like a pale oval, and if you had black skin it didn't even recognize you were there, and that was like bad public relations. You know? oh, yeah. So, uh, And Samsung, you can put a picture up of the person. Yes, <laughs> I know that works in, J in Japan, the uh, retailer, the people that serve you at retail stores have to have a smile, mm -hmm. and they have a device to see if you're smiling enough before you walk out and it will like, not let you out on the floor until you're smiling enough. <laughs> and so people have learned to carry a picture like a magazine guy smiling. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you know, that's, that's not, and also the early fingerprint sensors, you could make like a silly putty finger and a jello finger and it would work, you know. Yeah. So all of these have weaknesses. Anyway, next thing is someplace you are. If you're looking for something easy to use, many banks are now using this as the second factor because this way you don't need to mail people a token. You use their IP address. A lot of websites like Cloudflare notices this now. They say you've seen, every time you go to a different coffee house, they say, oh, we have to send you a token on your phone. You appear to be logging in from a different place. They remember your IP addresses. If you're somewhere else, they figure, wait a minute, you're an evil hacker. So. That's reasonable. Credit card companies totally yeah. use this to detect suspicious transactions and such. Yeah. I've had some uh, notifications from Yahoo about trying to sign in from a foreign country. Yeah, and... Yeah. and Let me try to hack my password. Yeah, yeah. well that certainly happens. Yeah. And uh, another thing that happens to me is when I connect to certain networks, I'm, I think when I go to a, a Hawaiian restaurant, I'm actually coming out in like Florida or something because they have like a corporate network when you connect yeah. to their Wi-Fi and you're yeah, actually sure. suddenly I'm in Georgia or something because that's where it comes out. Yeah, the post office, they have their gateway for the whole outside network is somewhere in Southern California. Yeah. No matter where, where you're at in the United States says you're in Southern California. Yeah, that's right because that's where their point of presence yeah. is. Oh, yeah. yeah. Anyway, so that's the game you can, uh, your credit card companies and other people can notice if you seem to be coming from an unusual location this way and this makes you safer. Um, so I got a few cahoots about that stuff. This is chapter six. Let me start to zoom for the people who are coming in online. Okay.
What would you add to a password to make two-factor authentication? IP address would do. That is uh, something about where you are. A PIN is just another thing you know, and two things you know is still single factor. That's like just having another password, and it doesn't improve your security. Wait, so if the IP address is like... The IP address is not something that you typed in. It's something automatically added to the packets as they leave. So it basically geolocates you. Oh, I see. So that's where you are in addition, and that's good enough, and that's what a lot of banks are using. Because it's so effortless. People don't even know what's happening. But well, how about the people that actually travel around the world then? Then it's a problem. Yeah. And they're cost what they'll happen in my I know what happened to Cloudflare, you'll constantly be told, wait, you appear to be evil hacker, you better go and take an SMS and approve this. And you have to keep on approving things. Another option is to store a cookie on your machine and use that instead. So they recognize that you're still using the same machine instead of that you're still the same IP address. But yeah, that's an issue. They all have a dark side. There's always some situation in which they make trouble. All right, so what file contains password hashes on Unix? All right, it's the shadow file. The password file hasn't contained passwords in decades. Uh, it did long ago in the 70s, but now it's in the shadow file. All right, so what stops online brute force attacks? Yeah, that's lockout. You, that's the, where they just try many passwords online, then you just lock them out after a certain number of failed guesses. Uh, the salt does nothing. Salt just affects how it's stored on the local server, and that has no effect on an online attack, where you're just trying a bunch of passwords in a login form. What's the weakest hash system here? Okay, LM, the old password hashes used by Windows uh, before, I think, Windows XP. I think Windows XP when Turbo 2003 still had it on by default. And then it went off in Vista. But anyway, that's the really old one. NTLM is their giant leap forward to MD4. SHA-1 is better than that. And Linux is millions of times better. It's 5,000 rounds of SHA-512. Plus Assault, a modern Linux system. All right. So what biometric system lets unauthorized people through? Okay, that's a high false accept rate. That's what that means. A false accept is when you let unauthorized people in. All right, so I got E, I know who that is, and I know who DJS is. We'll see. Anyway, so then there's the technologies underpinning this stuff. Um, you need a centralized point of access control. Uh, people that have small businesses might try buying workstations and not having a domain controller, and they will rapidly discover this is miserable as People don't all have the same account. They don't all have the same password. People that leave, the accounts aren't all deleted. New people that come in, the accounts they need aren't created. And pretty soon, you've just lost all control. So you need a central point for it all. And this is why Novell made their money. Novell made the first central point of administration with their Novell servers. And Microsoft put them out of business, essentially, well, partly through their own incompetence. But Microsoft replaced them by having their own Windows domain controllers. So you would have the special, and that's the point of it. The domain controller provides um, a central point. It can also provide single sign-on, so you can access many servers once you've logged in once. And you get AAA services, which is the fundamental uh, essential activity needed on a network to authorize, authenticate people, and this has been around since the telephone network. Authentication, authorization, and accountability. You need to have some way of verifying who people are, some way of limiting what they're allowed to do based on who they are, and some way to record what they do so you can bill them for the phone network and on Windows networks so you can audit them to like have a security review later of see who did the bad thing, who stole the money. You know. So decentralized access control is where you allow your local sites of your company to do things without it all going to the single to the central point of the company. This gives more local power, but it also means people might not obey the policy. Our college did not have central access control, central uh, control of the antivirus on campus, and it turned out there was one lab where they didn't have enough RAM, and they actually took the antivirus off the machines to make them run faster, and then they got infected with viruses, of course, and that's the kind of thing that might happen if you let each local site have control over things. Um, Anyway, discretionary access control is DAC, not decentralized access control, which is a rather rare thing to come across. Single sign-on is where you sign into one machine, and now you can get some kind of token that you can use to get into many machines. In the real world, Facebook seems to be the single sign-on for the whole internet. Every site will let you log in with Facebook. Um, 
But in, in, in Windows domains, it's the domain controller. But there are various systems. And somehow, if you sign into that one point, you now have a token. So people who can compromise that central server can get into everything. And people who find some way to manipulate or reuse the token can get in everywhere. And that's what um, Curb, uh, Mimi Cats does. I think it's Benjamin Delphi, the New Zealand guy, has always got a new version at every DEF CON of Mimi Cats. He could totally mess with the tokens that Active Directory uses in Windows domains. He totally finds a way to make the golden ticket for Kerberos and everything else uh, to mess with the single sign-on system. The improved versions of the past the hash attack. He's got a new one every year, and Microsoft never seems to catch up. <laughs> um, the single sign-on. Uh, should be combined with dual factor. If people are going to get privileges to many machines, it would be a good idea to have two factors to make sure you actually know who they are before you give them that token. But the problem is the attacker can hijack the session. Um, so this has uh, been a trick, been a problem forever. You just let the user log in, and then you intercept the traffic and take over their session somehow. On the web, you do it often by stealing a cookie, but it's an issue. And this is why people are supposed to be trained to lock their workstations. I've heard of companies where um, if you find a workstation unlocked and someone's walked away, you cancel their account, or they even get fired on the spot, um, which is kind of unreasonable. Something I've heard that seems a whole lot more intelligent, that I've heard systems that connect to the Bluetooth in your phone, and they notice when you walk more than 10 feet from your computer and automatically lock out. That would be my preferred solution to that problem, rather than demanding that humans remember something that's hard to remember and punishing them ruthlessly for forgetting it. Because I'm very absent-minded. I would totally be the guy that forgot to do it. <laughs> uh, your provisioning cycle. You're going to be handing out passwords. Then you've got to have some kind of rules about updating them and so on. Tell them when they're going to expire. Notify them. Revoke access. And somehow coordinate these things. Uh, this is actually a big deal. I know at the college and also at companies, you have some people that just wander off. And you don't really know if they're fired or they quit or what. Are they sick? Or did they get hit by a car? They're just gone. And nobody's really quite sure whether to cancel their account or what. And so you've got to have an organized system where you have a decision made. This person is terminated. All their accounts should be revoked. I worked at a company that was pretty serious about security. And their process was people would screw up and get fired. So they would call me and say, OK, this guy is about to get fired. He's walking to the back room to get fired. You cancel his account right now. <laughs> so he's, his account is nuked. Then he gets fired. Then we take him back to his desk and pack up his books and shove him out the door. But um, he has no time period in which he's fired and still has access to the system. And that's typical in high-tech businesses these days. There's no severance pay or anything. You can't have someone disgruntled still on the system messing with things. <laughs> So access aggregation is what tends to happen. As people persist at a company and move from role to role, they get more and more privileges. This totally happens at the college. If you're a teacher here, every time you get a class in a new classroom, they give you more keys, and they never ask for them back. So if you can't get into a room, you just look for the oldest guy, and he's got a drawer full of keys. <laughs> so anyway, um, this is also authorization creep, where people just accumulate more and more privileges. And this, of course, defeats your controls like least privilege and separation of duties as you think two people have to work together to do something. But some people have actually accumulated both privileges, and they can do it without that. So you should be auditing these things, just like any other high privilege thing. Federated identity management is a really big deal. This is where you somehow arrange to automatically trust another company. Uh, the main case I know is the one I heard about from Microsoft. Microsoft gets their checks printed by ADP, Ross Perot's company, like almost every company in America seems to. I don't know, I guess they're cheaper or something, but everybody uses them. So if you get a W-2 from Microsoft, it does not come from Microsoft. It comes from ADP. So every a Microsoft employee had to make another name and password to get into ADP. So Microsoft finally said, this is for the birds. So they put a federated identity management server inside ADP. They worked it out with them. So your Microsoft login would get you into ADP to get your W-2. And then they had the first round of layoffs and fired a bunch of people. And when those people tried to get their W-2, they couldn't get their W-2 because they no longer could get an active domain. Mm -hmm. So it's like everything, it's got a good side and a bad side. But anyway, this is where you trust someone else to be your identity provider. And like I say, on the internet, it seems to be Facebook. Everybody has an option, log in with Facebook instead of logging an account with us. Obama proposed this. This is one of his many stupid things he proposed and then pretended the next day he hadn't said that. He was going to have the US government be the identity provider for all of America. So people didn't have to remember so many passwords. You would go to the federal government, log in, and that would be the token that logs into everything else. And everyone said, are you out of your mind? 
because apparently nobody told Obama, but government systems are 10 years behind industry. Yeah. <laughs> and industry is 10 years behind the best industry. And there is no way in the world that a typical corporation is going to lower their security down to the security of the federal government. <laughs> this is like, yeah. you know, it's so you got to be out of your mind. I'm not, banks are not going to believe that or lower their security down to this level. And so this just vanished, like a lot of things he proposed. He just pretended he never said that. Um, <coughs> so security, SAML is a very popular system used to do this. It is an XML based framework to handle this federal identity management system. So you log in, and of course I made one, so let me just show you that one. I'm gonna be doing it more in the other class. But here's my SAML example. This is my service provider, sp.samsclass.info. And when you log in, it goes to a different service. I have to bring, okay. The different service is called IDP, Identity Provider. So you go to some other service, and you log in here, like you might at Facebook, and then you're logged in as user one. And the reason you're logged in as user one, you can see it in Burp, is because you have this token. And the token is this horrible mess here called the SAML response. That giant blob of data is the token provided by the identity provider. And that proves who you are. And if you open it and look at the underlying XML in SAML, it shows up like this down here. And I wonder if I can copy and paste this into something to make it bigger. I'm thinking there, I think I can. Let me put it in a text editor. There, nope, that didn't work. No, it doesn't look like it's letting me copy it. I'm going to try one more, and then I'm just going to zoom in for the people in the room. But I know some people are connecting online, so that's rude. Nope, select all, but it won't let me copy. That should copy, but it doesn't. All right, anyway, it's XML. So you've got these, um, it looks like HTML. It is a format, it starts with XML, and you have everything has opening and closing tags. And down here you have signatures and certificates that prove who you are. And at the bottom, you have what it proves. I'm user one with user one at test.com and so on. So this is your proof of who you are. And this can now be used at any service provider that plays the game. And they can call the APIs or run it through certain algorithms provided by the identity provider and verify this if they do. And that's what's really happening with SAML, which is one of the many common uh, single sign-on solutions. So you sign into one service, and you use the identity token at many services. Anyway, so identity as a service is one thing you can do here, also called cloud identity. Many companies have attempted to provide this. Microsoft made a few versions, like I say, Obama wanted the US government to do it. Uh, Microsoft had Live ID and so on. They have some way to let you log in here and provide some kind of token which people can use at their service providers. And um, so central management systems, are things the client might have, like password managers, so that they can handle it all. This is a good idea. Your password manager might generate passwords, store them safely, uh, make it easy for you to use a different password at every service, which you really should, because they're getting hacked like crazy at the other end. And if you like give Yahoo your password, and then you also use it at Gmail and Facebook, it's very likely that one of the other of those guys is going to lose it, and then people get in all your accounts. Um, all right. Uh, so there are third-party identity services. You can host your own third-party identity service locally if you want to at your company with Microsoft Cells, a federated identity management server for this. And then you can allow your internal applications to integrate with a cloud identity. You can also have some kind of partnership where you have some kind of cloud service from somebody else, but you arrange to have a local server to make it faster, like you often put branch domain controllers in local offices so people can log in more quickly than sending all their credentials back to the main domain controller. Anyway, LDAP is a system of moving data around on a network. Uh, this is what Active Directory uses over, goes over TCP or UDP 389. It can do it in plain text or encrypted with TLS and it sends data over the network, uh, your information about your login, like your home folder and such. Kerberos is the third-party authentication service developed at MIT, also used by Active Directory. The point of Kerberos is to avoid sending passwords over the wire. So instead of sending your password, you, you get a ticket that gives you the permission to access one service for 10 hours, and then you have to get a new ticket. And the ticket is a pseudo-random number and uh, uses encryption and mutual authentication and has a special ticket-granting server. 
and in fact, the ticket is related to your password, and there are cracking tools that will try to extract your password from the ticket. Like I mentioned, Mimi Cats will manipulate tickets and try to crack into tickets and such, finding the various weaknesses in the system. None of them is perfect, of course. Is there any way to remove the correlation between your password and What's the ticket? What's that? Is there a way to remove the correlation between the password and the ticket? Or to improve the correlation? To remove the correlation. Remove, no, there is no way to remove the correlation. I mean, it has to have some information about your password. And as far as I know, there aren't even like different levels of security in Kerberos. Hmm. It seems to be all one thing. And it's got all these systems. And for the CSSP exam, it's mostly just to notify the words. You've got a principal and a realm and a ticket. Key distribution center, ticket granting service, ticket granting ticket, client server, and what Mimi Katz does is there's something called a golden ticket, which identifies the ticket, the ticket issuing server, and that thing is good for 25 years. And he figured out a way to find and steal the golden ticket, so now he can just issue all the tickets he wants. Hmm. So you know, there's that's how it works. It does not send your password in plain text, but it you can extract information from it, but that's not what the typical attack is. The typical attack does not extract the password, but you find a way to mess with all this. That's what Mimi Katz does. Anyway, um, so here's the Kerbo steps. Alice tries to contact the key distribution center saying, I want to prove who I am. They then send you, after she gives them a password, they give her a session key. Then she decrypts the session key and uses it to request permission from the ticket granting service. Then the ticket granting service verifies the session key and sends her another session key. And then a service ticket encrypted. Then she connects to the printer and the printer sees a valid key so she gets service. So it amounts to similar to like that SAML thing. You get this blob of data, but in fact involves several services running. And uh, that's the steps here. Key distribution center, ticket granting server, all to get access to the printer, the secured object. And it turns out that some of these objects have a lot of information and are high-value targets to attack on the network. So one, that's one of the weaknesses of Kerberos. Anyway, you typically get 10 hours to access something once you're approved. Everything has a timestamp. And this is why you may, if you take any Microsoft server classes, they will, Microsoft always says you have to synchronize the time on every server. Because if the time is wrong by more than five minutes, then the timestamps will not be recognized. And you will not get in even when you have a valid credential. So this is why everybody uses NTP to synchronize all their clocks. Because if they were to get too far off, everything would stop working. So the key distribution center stores all the keys. You can compromise it to steal everything. There's, there's single points of failure. If either one of these things is unavailable, the whole system stops. You can replay attacks for 10 hours for the lifetime of the authenticator. There's Kerberos 4 and Kerberos 5. Uh, Kerberos 4 had a way to, for a user to do a horizontal privilege escalation by getting a key for another person and guessing a password. And uh, you can also steal keys from a client's RAM. Those are the main weaknesses. They're not too serious, but everything does have some weaknesses. So Sesame is an alternative system for European systems, and uh, it's got public key encryption. Everything in Kerberos is private key encryption. So you, it has these symmetric keys that are high-value targets, which, if stolen, will compromise the system. Sesame has a different system that supposedly is less. The radius and diameter are other services used to do AAA. Radius was so old, it's named dialing. It was intended for 56K dialing services, but of course, it works for faster networks, too. And this is a AAA server. Um, it doesn't typically handle the credentials. It handles the login and goes to another device to do the credentials. Diameter is the successor which uses uh, TCP instead of UDP. And TakeAx is Cisco's system. The original one was, I think, open, um, intended to do the same thing, a AAA server. Uh, and TakeAx Plus is the newer one that has two-factor authentication and encrypts the transmissions and such. Uh, this is what you'll be using if you buy a Cisco VPN concentrator. You'll be using TakeAx Plus. Now, in the early days, there was PAP, where you just sent the password directly over the wire like you might for FTP or Telnet. That's the old system from before the internet, and obviously terrible to use on the internet. So to prevent people from just sniffing passwords right off the wire, they went up to CHAP, where the server sends you a challenge. You add the challenge to your password and hash it, and then send that over. So at least your password is not sent in plain text over the network. This, however, is not very strong. It turned out to be pretty easy to crack those hashes. So. That was no good. 
and Microsoft went up to MS Chat version 2, which is a lot better, although still considered broken these days. So Active Directory domains, you break your network into a domain, like company.com, and then you have sub, like ns.company.com and location1.company.com. Uses Kerberos, and you can now specify how much you trust authentication at other domains. So I can say, I am Microsoft, Yahoo is a business partner. Anybody that signs in with Yahoo will get some access to Microsoft resources with their Yahoo account, and you can totally specify how much access they get to this part, and that's what that's why Microsoft makes so much money. The Active Directory domains can handle multinational companies and the real business relationships they have with other companies, and there's nothing else up there for you. So if you're a Bank of America and you're going to buy Wells Fargo and implement their 100, add their 100,000 machines to your domain, you need Microsoft Active Directory. There is no other product in the world that can handle that job without driving you mad. Anyway, that's the game here, and that's those are the trusts between these are called transitive or non-transitive trusts, and one-way or two-way trusts, whether people from Yahoo are going to be trusted at Microsoft, but are people at Microsoft going to be trusted at Yahoo, and if so, in what subdirectory, what subdomain, and with what privileges, and all those are adjustable, and that's why they pay big bucks if you get a lot of Microsoft Windows Server certifications, you can be the guy handling those big operations at big companies. I know people that do that. There's two people I know that will go all over doing that. One is uh, Microsoft Windows admins that really know how to do that stuff. Another one is people that really understand um, BGP. These guys run as consultants all over the world solving their problems <laughs> for companies because those things are not easy at the top and somebody has to handle the big issues. So your access control typically is one of these three models, discretionary access control, mandatory, or some non-discretionary ones. Um, discretionary access control is typical of a home machine. Somebody owns the device and they can do anything they want with anything on that device. There's an owner and the owner can do anything they want. This is, uh, means that your security is totally dependent on that user not doing something stupid. All right, um, mandatory access control is the other extreme like the military uses where you can't do anything. You have to ask a top authority to approve everything. So everything's sorted into labels, confidential, secret, and top secret. And every time you want to do something, like move something from top secret down to confidential, you have to go to some higher authority and get approval and wait for it. So it's expensive and slow, time consuming and frustrating, but considered much safer, of course. Because you don't do things just because you want to do them at your discretion, you have to ask for permission to do anything risky. So uh, non-discretionary access control, where you do not have discretion, and there's two types, role-based and task-based where you have some limitations on what you can do. The role-based access control is by far the most common. This is what happens in Windows domains. You sort users into groups, like auditors, network engineers, and basic users, and each one of them has certain things they can do and things they can't do. And these are your Active Directory groups. This is what most people find works at a business, sort people into some reasonable number of groups, and then if you move them, they are removed from basic users and get promoted to a network engineer. You just take the account out of this group and put it in that group, and right away they have the privileges they need here, and they lose whatever privileges they used to have that they don't need anymore in their new role. Task-based access control focuses on tasks, um, which is similar but a slightly different way to look at it. Um, and you can also have rules, which is a more general, logical category of it all, like firewall rules. Uh, this is what you might have for things like um, time of day restrictions and uh, filtering the internet, where children can only go to certain kinds of sites but not other sites. Those are content and context dependent controls. You can often add these in to add defense in depth. Like one common restriction is you do not let anybody log in late at night. Normally everybody has to be can only log in until like 8 p.m., except for administrators. So if somebody was to steal a password from a normal user and then try to use it at midnight, it wouldn't work. But you can add other criteria here, um, which gives you some degree of defense in depth. Good, we're right on time. The last cahoots. I think that's it. That is it. Okay. All right. So, what system? accepts an identity from a different organization. That's federated identity management. Single sign-on might be just from the same company. But federated identity management, the federated part means you're trusting somebody else. 
what system runs on UDP 389? That's LDAP, Lightweight Directory Access Protocol. All right, how long does a TGT live? That's the thing, you're connected for 10 hours. You have a ticket granting ticket. It works for 10 hours. All right, which system is the European improvement over Kerberos? Sesame. All right. And what's the access control model do you have on a home laptop? That's discretionary access control on a home device. You are the owner, and you can do anything you want with that device and all the data on it. All right. So it's E times 2 and Ron times 2, and Jeffrey's the new winner. All right. So... Uh, that's it. I'll go to the lab after I clean up here and help anybody that wants to work on projects. And uh, next week, we'll do Chapter 7. And after that, we'll have a chapter, but we'll also have the early presentation. So you guys should be making sure you're making progress on your next presentation. Okay. Is there a topic for the early presentations? Or uh, no, just like before, any security topic will do. The last ones were very good, so more like that would be fine.